When I started my first sampler quilt, my analytical brain wanted to organize all the blocks into four patches, nine patches, stars, etc. But I quickly gave up because it was just too many. My next guest, Barbara Brackman, had the same idea, except she started 30 years before me and she never gave up. And lucky for us, it has now been published as the Encyclopedia of Pieced Quilt Patterns. Along the way, she's authored many books about the history behind the patterns, that is the quilters, the fabrics, and the times. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Barbara Brackman. What came first, your interest in the Civil War or your interest in quilting? Oh, definitely quilts. And, you know, I only got into uh, the Civil War in quilts because a publisher, maybe 30 years ago, after I had done this book uh, and some others with him, he said, what? You know, the Civil War sounds great. He was from Tennessee. Why don't you do a book on quilts from the Civil War? And I said, what? There can't be any quilts from the Civil War. But 30 years later, I can still <laughs> manage to come up with a story every week. And a good story. I mean, I'm not just making these up. The quilts were so important a part of people's lives. And that war was, you know, such a horrible thing that you can just take them and put them together and tell quite a bit about a woman. And you know, war, women, those stories never get told. Yes, my grandmother survived World War II. She came out of it with two young children and no husband. And, you know, when the last couple of years thinking of COVID and what were the struggle we've had to deal with, I have her front and center of my mind, you know, like you she know, really had to deal with stuff. You know, my grandmother, her parents were killed in France by the Nazis. And she was over here. They had been here and they went back to France right before the war because they didn't like it here. And so she never heard from them again. And so I think of her all the time. I can be brave. She's the bravest woman I ever knew. I can be as brave as she was. Of course, when I would ask her about her family, she'd have pictures. I'd say, now who's this? He says, she burst into tears. And said, I can't talk about it. <laughs> so I never heard any stories, which was probably good for an 11 year old. She didn't need to hear. But, uh, you know, we look back at that time and that was tough, tough, tough. So how then did you come to quilting? Well, I was from New York where my, my family immigrated to. And we didn't have any quilts. They didn't make quilts. But I went, my, we moved to Kansas City and I went to college in Kansas and everybody had a quilt on the river. And so I thought, I'll make my own because I was an art student and I loved textiles. So that's how I got into it was just jealousy. Now I listened to an interview and there was the finding of the quilt patterns from the Kansas City Star. When was that? I'd say 1968 or nine, because I had gotten a book from the library and got some patterns out of that. And then I found these full size patterns, if, you know, from the Kansas City Star. And that just sort of started me collecting it, as well as trying to make quilts from these patterns. You talking about how you started this book. Now mm -hmm. I know when I first started and I did my first sampler quilt and I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a library of these blocks. I'm going to keep all the stars together and I'm going to keep these ones together. And I started looking and one, it was really, really hard to do. And then two, you would find the same block over and over again with five different names. And I quickly gave up, but I kept looking for something like this. And I am so glad that you've came up with it. I didn't give up and I enjoyed doing that so much. I taught at that point, I was teaching special education with four and five year olds. And so my day was very, very intense. And then I'd come home and I thought sorting these patterns out is the most fun. So I, that was sort of my relaxation right after work as I'd sit around, you know, and, and sort those patterns. And I had a little bit of a library background. I had wanted to go to library school, but I never did. And so I knew something about systems. And my father was a computer programmer and he ran the house on systems, you know. He, he, that's just the way he thought too. So I, I realized the problem with the names and that's how Carrie Hall did her index is she did it by names that then you have five, you have to make five index cards for each block. So I thought you could separate these by C lines and you know, they're nine patches or they're stars as you say, and then make a card with five names on it instead of five cards with five drawings. 
So that's sort of how it got started. And I made that index cards and, and my friends would all say, uh, gee, I'd like a copy of those. And so then at night, instead of sorting, I was drawing little in square pictures, which I enjoyed too. So, so that's how it started. Now, of course, it's computerized and I don't, I don't do the programming. So it's pretty fabulous to me that programmers are a lot, lot smarter than I am programming there. So you started digging. How did you start digging? You know, I went to a lot of thrift stores. I was of that generation where we take a couple of quarters on Saturday and go and buy antiques, you know. We found the most wonderful things for cheap prices. So, um, but I was, I was always looking for the quilt patterns and, and I found them all the time. You know, people's scrapbooks or their packages. And also in my job in special ed, after a while, I uh, spent a couple of years, instead of having my own classroom, I went to other people's classrooms and gave them advice from the, for the university and from the state board of education. And that meant I spent a lot of time in rural towns overnight. And so I'd go to the public library and see what they had. You know, and every library would have a file uh, with, under the, I don't know what they're called, but the file folders. And they would have under Q for quilt because people save the clippings. And so I got an awful lot of them through those small libraries in, uh, in Kansas. And, uh, you know, once I start collecting anything, and as many collectors are, you become obsessive. You must have every last one. And that, that was certainly, certainly beat some of the other things I was collecting, you know, big things. <laughs> and so uh, furniture, walnut furniture. So it was, it was something I could, I could uh, have some control over. Now I've given all those paper patterns to the University of Nebraska now. So I don't have any of them left, but I'm doing it all digitally. And I still am looking for patterns I never saw before, but digitally and they're easy to file. So you found the patterns, but did the pattern start? Like the style of the block, did that start when the pattern was made or did you find that they probably existed before that? This was just the first oh, time certainly. that they were written down. You know, people have been making patchwork quilts for centuries. And in America, you really, now this is stuff I've learned since a long time ago, but, but mostly digitally, because I can look at so many pictures and sort of compare. But people in the United States did not really start making patchwork quilts until there was a United States, until after the revolution. So some of the earliest patchwork that we have in this country is about 1785. Um, and it started out of blocks, stars, the simple things, nine patches, and uh, then it really caught on in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. So just patterns were just invented left and right, but they weren't printed in publications because they newspapers didn't really have any way to do that. You know, it was all just typed with a couple of cuts like a finger or a flag or something until about 1880 when newspapers got the technology to print a picture pretty cheaply. And once that was available, then you could put a picture of the, of the block in the newspaper. And they did that to attract female readers and sort of as, as you know, PR. And as a service, the readers would write in and say, I need, a, I need a birds in the air pattern. Does anybody have one? But because it was in a little square, that dictated how the patterns were going to be shown. So you don't get the delectable mountains, you know, with the medallion, you can't really fit that into a little square. So some patterns and the medallion format sort of just drifted off and we became much more oriented to blocks. And then you see at that time, people kind of presenting quilts and blocks as the newspapers did, a grid. All their blocks were on the square and they'd like to put a big fat sashing in there. And so definitely the printing dictated style. Right, the access. And did you find that there were regional flavors or let's say social economic flavors as well to the blocks? Regionalism is something I've spent the past couple of years on. I think that's one of the most important areas for research. So I started a Facebook page called Quilt History South and it's got about 1500 members and we just look at Southern quilts. And last week we looked at pickle dishes, you know, which is a great kind of wedding ring pattern with spiky points. And I, they showed us 
they, you know, several people showed us some wonderful pickle dishes. They are collectors of pickle dishes. But I looked through the quilt index, which summarizes some of the findings of the quilt project over the past 30 years. And I found that really it is a regional pattern that they don't have any pickle dishes before somebody published the pattern. Once the pattern is published, and this was published in 1930, once that pop pattern is published, then it becomes national. But before that, all over the South, you see these spiky wedding rings passed around, I guess, hand to hand. And mostly they came from Tennessee. So you can imagine women in Tennessee, somebody drawing this up and everybody saying, my gosh, I have to make that. Let me trace your quilt. And then it went, you know, with immigrants and family members west and more south, down to Alabama and things like that. So you do see regionalism, and I'm really working on that. And I'm also working on the opposite, is which is New York style too. And as far as socioeconomic, boy, it's hard to judge what someone's socioeconomic class was, you know. I, I looked through the censuses and somebody's worth $50,000 in 1860. That's a lot of money in 1860, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then someone else is worth 100. And she, that might be the seamstress that's making clothes for the woman whose husband has 50,000. So I don't understand economics. It's, it's arithmetic for one thing, but I, uh, I, you know, I don't understand economics well enough to really say that. Plus, as now, people bought quilts from other people. And so you get at the lower end of the socioeconomic class, the woman has no husband and sews to feed her kids. And she is working for the woman who has $50,000 a year. Well, no, $50,000 in assets in 1860. And the quilt was made by the lower class woman, but it is owned by the upper class woman made for her taste. So I don't, mm. I don't think you really can look at that um, without understanding the economics. And it's so hard to understand women's work because over and over the census says at home. Well, how did she support herself at home? Mm -hmm. She had no husband either died or you know, had some serious emotional problems or she was one of those women who decided she wasn't gonna get married and she wasn't gonna live on her brother and she and her maybe another sister or a friend went into the seamstress business. So that's a long answer to your question. In the making of the patterns, are women doing the making of the patterns or are the men doing the making of the patterns? Don't know. Do Don't not know. know. You know, I'm not great at geometry, but my friend Bettina is. And so, you know, we always used to, we used to go to retreats and he just, Bettina, draw me this circle. I'm not good at it. Um, but I, I wonder if geometry is sex related, you know. Uh, I doubt it. There are, there are always women that are very good at mathematics and at that flat surface stuff. I'm terrible at, at, at direction and flat surfaces. But uh, I would think women were drawing those patterns. Um, when you enter the 20th century, we have men designing patterns. There's a great, a great source for quilt patterns from Des Moines in the 30s, Hubert Vermeeren. And Hubert uh, drew wonderful patterns. Of course, he, I don't know that Hubert sewed. So some of them were pretty hard to do, but he loved, you know, he loved his compass. And he, I used to have many compasses, you know, different sizes. And now I just draw them in each year. It's so much easier. The size of blocks, were the patterns all different sizes or was there just a particular size that people worked with? Oh, no, I, I, I think... Let's see, that's an interesting question. You have interesting questions. Um, you don't see much uh, variability in one quilt. So let's say you're going to make a sampler in 1850 and get your friends. The blocks would be the same size for the most part. There might be a big central focus. But by 1890, you start seeing samplers made up of, like your, you know, the quilt behind you, all different sizes of blocks and fitting in like rectangles. And I think that's a function of the, the printing, the magazines and the pattern companies printing patterns and mailing them to you. So they're very arbitrary sizes. And if you can't draw, you just make that block that size. So samplers um, of different blocks certainly changed style too in the, uh, the 1880s and 1890s. 
there's also regionally, I don't know, but at town wise, there's a, a preference for doing giant applique blocks that are 36 inches or so, you know, four block quilts, big. My friend Terry Thompson used to specialize in those. And, and, and I mean, it's a great thing to do because the pieces are big, it's just a lot of sewing, but, but you know, the curves are very easy to get because you're working with such a big piece. And that four block thing, um, I, I would think that's probably Civil War era, 1850s, 60s. And it, it became kind of out of fashion. And that's why Terry tried to bring it back and read several books about it and did some great quilts. We like to use acronyms when we quilt, like HST and uh, mm -hmm. all these other little UFOs and things like that. Did you find that there were standardized terms or was there a, a big variability in describing different shapes and techniques? Oh, no, I never saw the acronyms, never saw HST, you know, um, those things. They might call them by their geometric names. And, you know, one of my favorite things is to find the picture of a hexagon with six sides and have the newspaper columnists call it an octagon, <laughs> which, which makes it hard <laughs> to draw the pattern when you're trying to figure out what, what is she talking about? But it's mostly they would use ge geometry more than anything. No little, no little terms that everyone understands. And you know, I, I'm on Facebook a lot, and I still don't understand most people's acronyms. I, I made a video of all the acronyms oh, because there's just so many of them, right? You know, the Oxford English Dictionary last year, the year before, tried to collect some quilting terms. You know, they're always trying to collect English, and uh, so they asked people like me to, uh, you know, ask their readers. And so we've got a, a lot of interesting new terms, a little UFO, you know, un, unfinished object. Um, we, at my, at my, one of my groups, we uh, recently brought our unfinished objects and traded them. <laughs> we figure we're never gonna get it done. Maybe someone else, would. but there were, we call, I called them turnips because they turned up at the bottom. You go, what was I thinking when I started this? My favorite is wombat, waste yes. of money, batting, and time. <laughs> yes, yes, I've seen wombat. I, I know what that one means. So this book, this book is pretty darn big. How many years of work is this? 30. Now, 30. here's the new one, but here's the first one, and it's a lot heavier and a lot thicker <laughs> and a lot harder to pick up. So we're making progress as far as I know. Thinner pages. And you know, I this is from Electric Quilt and they did the programming and they did the coloring and did the book layout. You know, I, uh, I'm i just amazed at their skills. Between the last version and this version, how many more blocks are in this one? You know, they counted and as I say, I'm not good with numbers. I think it's about 160 new ones. And I added, I added a lot of, um, Alice Brooks designs. I had never had a really good Alice Brooks column because she it just wasn't published in Kansas. And so my friend Mary Kay kept saying, you've got to get more Alice Brooks. So I found more Alice Brooks, mostly thanks to her. So I added some designers, but I also added some things that are never published, but just seem to show up like a, a regional Pennsylvania pattern. You might have one because they made them often, but they were never published. So I thought I'll change my rules a little bit and have some unpublished patterns in there too. If if I see them, you know, numerous times. I am so glad you made this. <laughs> I pre-ordered. I pre-ordered it. I couldn't wait for it to come in. <laughs> I am too. I you know, it's a great thing to have. And also, you know, what I use is the computerized thing. I I, I what I tend to do is I'll go, someone wants an Oklahoma dogwood. I'll look in the book. See if that's the one she wants, because it's, you know, you just scan through it. I'm I'm used to books. But then I get the number and I print it out in block base. Once I get the number, I I can do that because then I can file it and not not have a piece of paper. Did you find that there were blocks that African Americans made? You know, my friend Questa Benberry, who was African American librarian, who taught me everything I know about filing, she used to I love to find quilt patterns that she thought that were passed in that small community of African-American women in a certain area. And so she had a couple, but I, you know, I keep them in mind, but I just don't see, and she died, oh, 15 years ago, and she never, you know, really was part of the computer age. 
So she just was looking through books. But there are just a couple that Shooting Star is one of um, a pointed star with tails that go out to the corners of the block. That was one she thought. No, I, I you know, I really can't say we we found anything that substantiates that idea. I mean, the communities again. It's I've I've read interviews with women who are black women in who lived by making quilts. They made quilts, and they would talk about making quilts for the richer women of the town who would come to their quilt shows and then say, I want one in that pattern. And so that was sort of how, you know, it's all visual and people are visual whether what whatever their their ethnic background is. And so the visual people could just copy it like that. The others might ask her to draw it off. But uh, I think it really did cross cross any kind of racial boundaries to to more regional. You're not going to see the same quilt in Maine that you saw in in Memphis. Did you find that there were block styles that came, came with immigrants to North America that influenced? Well, that's an interesting question, but I have found, and when we did the Kansas Quilt Project, we looked at the, the ethnic background, you know, English uh, versus Italian. And what we found, what we, and it should be, you know, people should continue to do research on this, that making a quilt is, a, is an Americanization. Now, people do it in other countries, but England, Australia, it's not something that my grandmother, who was from Russia, would have done. And before she came over, she came in 1910, maybe. And she was a you know, teenager, but she never made a quilt. And she thought that was a real strange thing to do. She loved needlework and she was, and she crocheted everything, including, you know, things for me to wear in the 60s. That, so I, I don't think a crocheted dress is going to make it very long, especially with these silver threads. But I wish I'd kept them because they'd look so good today. But what we, so here we have a family that has Russian immigrant grandparents. Mother did not do any kind of needlework. She was played golf. That was her leisure. And then the granddaughter, me, who is very Americanized, has picked up making quilts. So you see that over and over again, that it's a generation beyond the woman who doesn't speak English well, and who hangs out in New York with all her friends from Russia drinking hot tea out of a glass. So who have you passed on your interest in quilting to? I have no kids. <laughs> no kids. I do have a lovely niece, though, my niece Natasha. And I've We've known her all her life and uh, she when she was five she would watch me make quilts and she wanted to make one so I you know I was busy <laughs> I have jobs and stuff so I said one day I'm going to cut up some red squares and some white squares and I'm going to show you how to put them together and I did and then I left her alone and she came in and she sewed all the red squares back together and all the white squares back together she missed the checkerboard concept so Natasha who has never made a quilt in her life but has quite a few from her auntie um, so I passed it to Natasha and someday she'll be 50 and those kids will be grown and she'll have time and maybe she'll make a quilt. But I certainly hope I passed it on to the students. I consider the readers students. And you know, they'll ask me some very basic questions. I go, oh, for heaven's sake. You know, the seam allowance. You mean seam? Is there a seam allowance in this pattern, you know? And I go, oh, how many times have I answered? And I think, no. You cannot be rude. You have to say yes. Now here's the here's how we do it. And and so I'm the teacher, and they're my kids, all of them. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many have learned anything about sewing from me. I'm not that great as a sewer, but certainly they've learned a lot about history and patterns. So is your personal style very eclectic, depending on what you've yeah. discovered, or do you have a particular style? I do have a style, and my as I say, my sewing is bad. I was never blessed with eye-hand coordination. And as you age, sometimes you, <laughs> it gets worse. So what I, what I tend to do is rely on the fabric, <laughs> grab people and not the needlework. I have people who sew for me that are so fabulous at sewing. And um, I can make the model in polka dots. And in fact, that's what we're working on now. We're making an applique sampler based on New York quilts from the 1850s. And every fabric in mine is gonna be polka dots. Now, Becky Brown and Bettina Havig, who are my sewers, um, they're using reproduction fabrics and have beautiful handwork. So they can make it look good and I can make it look crazy. And, and more lately, our motto is more dots, more cowbell. 
you know, I don't know that it adds to it. But only people of our age would get the more cowbell jokes. So you're a Moda fabric designer now. I have been for I'd say like 25 years. 25 um, years. 25 years. Now, when I started, there was no reproduction fabric on the market. And so they, you know, contacted me and my friend Terry Thompson. And we, things went well. We had four or five lines a year, but now everybody is not interested as much in purchasing reproduction fabric. So I, I do one or two lines a year. And uh, I, have, I have one that's somewhere on a boat right now in the middle of the Pacific. Because I tell you, that pandemic really has interrupted shipping, unbelievably. And then I have a William Morris line, which I we do over and over again because it's such a classic. That's coming out supposedly in the fall. Hopefully shipping will be better in the fall. Maybe you can answer my question about what is the difference between Civil War prints and primitive prints? Well, I don't like the word primitive. It's, you know, it has such a connotation of looking down. Yeah, it does, so doesn't everyone it? Everyone used to be primitive cultures, primitive societies. Every culture, I mean, I'm a believer I'm in that every culture has as much value as every other culture. And in art, they use the word primitive. You know, I have friends that have do wonderful primitive quilts, like, you know, uh, I'm thinking Alma Allen and Barb, her friend. I can't think, you know, names don't come up. But uh, Jan Paddock, and they do these in primitive style, but they're very much designer designer look that kind of imitates the simplicity of some old fashioned design, you know, applique designs mostly, but they take, they tweak it. They'll take a star. Nobody in the 19th century ever made a wonky star, you know, that looks like it's dancing. So these, especially, and this is from Kansas City, so that's why I know all these people, it became very fashionable in the 90s to do primitive color scheme, all browns, we used to say brown was a Christmas color. And uh, these wonky shapes and very simplified and call that primitive. But that's a designer term um, rather than an art history term or something. So uh, that's one thing. Then there's Civil War and what, and that's not my choice either. What I like to do on the salvage is tell you what year that my print was, because I have actual prints of all these things. I have thousands of prints that I've bought over the years. But put the date, 1840, 1860 is my guess. Now, to sell it, to market it, we like to use Civil War references. And then a lot of people, you look on eBay, Civil War quilt, that means 1840 to 1910. They, you know, they don't really know. And it's just a catch-all term that people look for. It's like feed sack too. We, oh, we just, my friends and my know-it-all friends, we go on and on about the use of the term feed sack, like the quilt behind me that's very 30s, 40s, 50s. Lots of splashy little prints. That's called feed sack. This is not made of feed sacks. I think it might, it might have been a kit when, that went awry. <laughs> she, um, but it's made of splashy small dress prints that were used for household goods and also especially for clothing. Why call those feed sacks? Well, because it communicates. So everybody knows what you're talking about. And if you think that every feed sack quilt was made from feed sacks, don't even think about where hot dogs come from. I mean, it's just a term. I got a beautiful collection of them yesterday and I'm just kind of fondling them feed off to sack? the side here. What did you get yesterday? It was a gift actually. And it's Joe Morton, but yeah. just this wonderful. <gasps> Joe, uh, she is so good. She is so good. And I would say that I'm more of a modern quilter, but mm -hmm. I, when I get something like that, I go, these are gorgeous. These are really, like, these are my colors, the colors that I like to work with. Yes. And I'm going to just see what I can do to make it modern. I know that's what's fun. And that's what Alma Allen and Jan Paddock did is they took those prints because they were basing them on those color schemes and made them modern, especially in Africa. Now that's old fashioned now because 20 years of you know, fashion, 20 years has gone by, but it'll come around again. And maybe you'll think of something completely new to do with reproduction coloring that nobody would seen before. I want to talk about labels. I'm just beginning to label my quilts. Oh, you and... don't have to. What would I do all day if everybody labeled their quilt? <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to 
they'd say the pattern name and when they made it, then I'd have nothing to do. So I once I kind of did a little study and I found 10% of antique quilts are labeled. Only 10. So don't feel, don't kick yourself. You know, it's hard. <laughs> that's the last thing. It's like when the carpenter comes and doesn't finish doesn't finish the job, you know, leaves just one little thing, then he's going to come back next Tuesday when it's not raining and he never shows up. <laughs> you know, the label on the quilt is something we're going to do next week. But what should we put on a label? What would be helpful? Name of the pattern. Put your own name. Put where you're from. Don't put your income. It would be useful. Though. <laughs> put your annual income. <laughs> your ethnic background, you know. Uh, no, don't put that. Your name, the place, the date. And I'd love to have the name of the pattern. And where you got it. You know, for my blocks of the month, I do blocks of the month on my Civil War a quilts page. I always give them a label that they can print out, which has the name of the quilt and the date. And then they can, because a lot of people feel, are not comfortable with writing on fabric. You know, they're, because they're not good handwriters. <laughs> and so it's nice to have it printed out for them. So do, have your favorite colors changed over time? Oh, yes. And right now, turquoise and red as you can see in turquoise the and red and you know it's been about two years this is and i did my bathroom in turquoise and red orange and it's, you know it's i love it now there's got to come a day because i once did my bathroom in olive green and, or avocado green and gold you know <laughs> one day i'm gonna go in and go this has got to go but right now it's very it's very let's see what we call that mid-century modern and i see you have Lime green's good too. <laughs> Lime green, turquoise, and a red orange. That's that's my favorite combination. I'm very partial to the turquoise and the orangey red. Yeah. Those are my my favorite colors. And it's just amazing how it's a happy place. You know, I can go visit other places, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's where I want to go back to. I bought an old mid-century modern house about seven years ago after living in a Victorian cottage for 40 years. And so I had to, I mean, I had to readjust everything. All that, I put the walnut furniture in there, but I kind of drape it with some turquoise to text. Um, and that's, that's the throw pillows on the couch, you know, they're the, the, the turquoise and the red, reddish orange. Um, so mid-century modern has really influenced me too, because the house is, is so obviously that. Are you still out in Kansas? Yes, I live in Lawrence, which is near Kansas City. So do you know Jackie Gehring? I did when she lived in Kansas City. She's yeah. very big into that mid-century style too. Oh, she... yes, she was so influential. How far have you gone traveling for quilting? Japan. That was fun. I did a tour of Japan with, for the uh, museum at the university. They loaned quilts, and so they sent me over, you know, to, for the PR, and I had a wonderful time, and I, but I, as I, you know, I got to, I'm 75 right now. As I got to be in my 60s, I could not maintain carrying enough stuff, you know, the quilts. This yeah. was even before there were PowerPoints, carrying the slides trays. And airports are not very amenable to people who have knee problems. Now I've gotten my knee replaced, but that's one reason I quit is I could, my knee was in terrible shape from arthritis. So I sort of, stop traveling and now I'm traveling of course by zoom that's a wonderful thing I'm going to Charleston tomorrow it would <laughs> I would have to sleep for a week after visiting you in Canada and then in Charleston but it's so wonderful to do it digitally and I don't think we'll ever go back to ignoring digital programs I mean I think we'll combine them with in person well I just think for like guild presentations and things like that there's there's going to have to be some segment of it because you can just talk to so many more people from around the world and for a lot less money. Yeah, the guilds are very happy with this. I mean, they can have many, many outside speakers instead of just two or three, because there are no hotel bills, no airfare. And even though I, I can complain about isolation, it's really mm -hmm. nice to attend a guild meeting from my sewing table and I don't have to get dressed. <laughs> But yeah. I do miss the coffee with my friends afterwards. Well, I know. And, you know, I have friends, the six know-it-alls. We, we have, for the past year half, had a cocktail party every Monday night to discuss the world of quilts. And uh, that, I really rely on that. And, you know, I never got to see, they live from Massachusetts to Tennessee. And I never really 
got to see them, but more once or twice a year. And now I see them every every Monday night, which is a real advantage. How many quilt cool tops do you yeah. own? Tops, tops, I bet I have a hundred. Now I sold three at a garage sale last year to my friend Kelly. And I knew what she would like. I kind of picked them for her. But uh, you know, I'm never gonna quilt these. I and some most of them I'm keeping so I can give them as a unit to a museum for study pieces for the most part. But those are the tops from 1850 and 1820. The ones from 1950, uh, they'll go, they're going at garage sales and I'll, I'll give them to AQSG for their auctions and things. Because uh, they've been fun to own, but man, the story. Do you have a class or a lecture that you like to give? Well, one of my favorite things, as I say, is regionalism. So I'm talking to the Charleston Guild tomorrow. And we're gonna talk, I, mean, I, I got to pick it. We're gonna talk about South Carolina quilts and how they're different from New York City quilts and Maine quilts. And so it, it changes with what I'm interested in. I love making a new lecture, even if it's only one time for Charleston. Um, so there's no real favorite. So if people wanna get a hold of you for a lecture, how do they contact you? They can email me at material cult, what word? at gmail.com and I look at that about once a week and then I, I'll get back to them you know I I try to keep it to two digital things a month because you got to get ready for them and it takes time. Yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of booked through August if you can, which is good well thank you so much for being on the show today you are just a wealth of information is this everywhere or just through EQA and Quilt Folk? Well, no, several people buy wholesale and retail it. So I, I'm thinking the magazine Quilt Folk has sold it. And I, I bet you can buy it through the standard uh, standard online stores and then you can ask your own shop, I'm sure. It's gone it's, into its second printing. Is it going third? The third printing. And this is the first book they ever did. They've done manuals that are, you know, uh, three punched and spiral bound but they've never done a book so that was it was an adventure we we put our pandemic year to good use well talk about a pent-up demand third printing oh, yes so. and i couldn't wait to get it like i went on a wait list oh. <laughs> to get this i hope everybody gets their copy i have mine i'm already dropping it and ruining the binding and stuff so i better <laughs> buy one to keep Thank you so much for being on the show. I hope well, one day we can have a coffee in person. We will. And we'll talk about some of your questions because nobody else has ever asked me those. I think we think alike. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Barbara Brackman. I know that we just touched the surface of her research and knowledge. If you'd like to learn more about her, join one of her Facebooks or purchase one of her books, I'll have her contact information in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Tom the Colorblind Quilter. Color is such a large part of quilting and we'll be talking about the challenges you face when you can't see all of them. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when it goes live. I have interviewed so many amazing people this past year. Check out the playlist below in case you miss one. Last week, I released my latest Stash Buster video. Not only is this quilt bright and cheery, it's fast, easy, and fat quarter friendly. So check it out. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube notifies you when I make new videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, my website at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.